Anine, bonjour, hello everyone. Welcome to today's webinar, Building Inclusive and Reciprocal Relationships with Indigenous Organizations and Communities. We will give everyone a few minutes to sign in before we start. As we wait, please introduce yourself and organization or OHT in the chat box. You can do this by selecting the chat box in the right-hand portion of your screen and selecting everyone from the dropdown. For those of you who don't know me, my name is Leslie Mejio. I work for Trillium Health Partners and I'm a focal point with RISE supporting population health management. My colleague at RISE, Steve Lott, is also supporting us behind the scenes to ensure that things run smoothly. If you have issues with Zoom, you can message him and he can help you resolve them. Today's session will build on the September webinar, which you can find on the events page. Today's session will provide you with an opportunity to join one of two breakout groups for a deeper discussion with a panel of experts on building inclusive and reciprocal relationships with Indigenous organizations and communities. Today is also about continuing to develop connections and share ideas with others. So as you join, please don't forget to introduce yourself in the chat box and select everyone. We're putting up a slide here, so that'll help you uh, if you are new to Zoom. Hi, Sheila, welcome. Thank you for joining us today. Hi, Marilyn, thank you for joining. Nice to see you and Jocelyn from OH. We also have um, today's session was led by the Indigenous Primary Care Council with a panel of experts. We are honored to have with us Maurice Switzer Benisi as one of the panelists. Maurice is a citizen of the Mississaugas of Elderville First Nation and a knowledge keeper. Today he will share with us the teachings which stem from the medicine wheel. Thank you, Maurice, for spending time with us today and giving us the gift of your knowledge. I'd also like to welcome Dr. Pamela Toulouse, who will speak to helpful resources for monitoring, delivering, and facilitating cultural safety education and training. Thank you for teaching us today. Welcome also to those of you who are signing uh, in in the chat box. Hi, Amber from Middlesex London OHT, and Brittany from Kingston. Hi, Kim, nice to see you. Alexandra, nice to see you too. Hi, Joe, thank you for joining. Oh my goodness, it's coming in so quickly today, I can barely keep up. Hi, Laura, nice to see you. And Julia from Kingston. Good morning, George, thank you for joining. As a quick reminder, for those of you who just joined, make sure you select everyone from the drop down so that we can all see who's joining today. I'd also like to welcome Dr. Paula uh, Chedwick, who will teach us to share on how to share power and make ethical commitments towards justice, and also Dr. Stephanie Nixon, who will speak to privilege and allyship. Thank you both for teaching us today. We're also thankful to have with us Brett Recolet, who will share with us examples of building inclusive and reciprocal relationships with youth. Thank you for taking the time to share this with us today, Brett. Welcome also Tony from Brampton and Topico and Arun and Sushma from, P from the PFAC. That's great to see PFAC team here as well. Thank you for joining us today. We also have organizations supporting OHTs from across Ontario, as well as the Ministry of Health and Ontario Health. Welcome to all and thank you for joining and participating. Continue to sign in in the chat box and introduce yourself. Today's also about building a community and connecting you with others. Please note that throughout this webinar, feel free to add your questions and share your learnings in the chat box too. Following the session, we will share a summary of the discussion and the deck on the RISE website. Okay, I'm just gonna take a quick number, look at the number. So we're getting close to the number of people who have registered today. Um, so we are going to start uh, the session. We'd like to begin today by recognizing we are all joining from different places across what we now call Ontario and that we are all located on traditional territory of Indigenous peoples. As a RISE partner based in Mississauga, I am using the Indigenous Traditional Land Acknowledgement Statement, which was developed by the Indigenous peoples in our region. As we meet here today, we are in solidarity with Indigenous peoples of Turtle Island and would like to begin by acknowledging the land on which we gather is part of the treaty lands and territory of the Mississaugas of the Credit and before the traditional territory of the Haudenosaunee, Huron, and Wendat. We also acknowledge the many First Nations, Inuit, and Métis people who call this area their home. We are grateful for the opportunity to be working on this land. 
Land acknowledgements offer a moment to recognize the rule of treaty making, appreciate the land on which we live, and the importance and learning from our Indigenous community members, applying it to our ways of living, working, and being together. I recognize the relationship we have to each other and the responsibilities we have as guests on this land. The importance of caring for and preserving them from the Russian Credit Valley shown here to the salmon who leap upstream in the fall. Please take a moment to reflect on the responsibilities you have as guests on Indigenous territory in your region. We also invite you to visit the link provided to learn more about treaties. I'm now like to pass it over to one of our RISE co-leads, co Dr. Rob Reed, to introduce the Inter Indigenous Primary Care Council. Rob? Yeah, thanks very much, uh, Leslie, and welcome to everybody here. Uh, my name is Rob Reed, although it appears like I'm Leslie McGill on the on the screen. I'm not quite sure why that's the case, but anyway, my name is Rob Reed. I'm a chief scientist at Trilling Health Partners in Mississauga, and I'm also one of the co for, um, for RISE. Uh, and I have the kind of the pleasure again to welcome IHPCC to the, uh, an, a RISE event today. Uh, we had a wonderful session uh, last month. Uh, we're on for a, a, a doubly better, a better session today. So just welcome back uh, to uh, the Indigenous Primary Health Care Council. Um, like, uh, like RISE, the IPHCC is in Ontario. Um, our health team central program of support, uh, and we uh, have been collaborating all along the last few months. Uh, their mission is to create transformative and decolonizing change within systems, organizations, and healthcare providers, which is extraordinarily relevant to the development of Ontario health teams in this province. Uh, and the vision is for a, a health system where Indigenous people have access to high quality, safe care, and are treated with empathy, dignity, and respect. Um, so I'd now uh, like to hand it over to Dakota Rekulet, who is the Cultural Safety Manager, I, I Dakota, um, and, and she'll uh, be moderating and facilitating today's session. So thank you very much. Thank you, Rob. Um, and before we move forward, I am going to ask Morris to open our session for us today in a good way. Um, this is something we quite often ask of before we do any sort of workshops or presentations. Um, so I'll hand it over to you, Morris. Miigwech. Miigwech, Dakota, and, and, and Miigwech, Rob, and, and, and Leslie, thank you very much for, for calling us all experts. Um, I was taught that an expert is anybody who gets off an airplane. That's what, that's what I was taught. So but we're going to do our best. Um, um, before I, I, I give uh, a, a, a traditional, it's a, it's a Thanksgiving actually, which, which um, Indigenous peoples like to try to remember to do every day. Um, every day is Thanksgiving. I, I just want to, uh, you know, to thank everybody for their time and for, for joining us today. Um, you know, healthcare obviously is is critical, uh, critical component of all great societies like like Canada and Ontario, and um, you're going to hear some words that that um, bother Canadians. You're going to it's at some point today you're going to hear the word racism, and uh, um, really systemic racism just means that in countries. Uh, like Canada, um, around the world, uh, the systems of governance and and law and and justice and health and uh, we're we're all created for and by people of of uh, um, primarily one culture, European culture, and we're still living with those systems and and. Uh, uh, that means that the people of those original cultures who originated those systems are the ones that primarily benefit from them. And it means that people from other cultures, whether they're indigenous or, or, or not, uh, we sometimes actually suffer harm, um, uh, often inadvertently by, by being um, involved in those systems. So, so uh, that's what we're talking about. We wanna make uh, Ontario's uh, healthcare system, the strongest it can be for everybody, everybody. And uh, that's what we're talking about today. Um, and the slide that you see, it's called a medicine wheel. And um, there are many teachings. Um, 
I'm, I'm talking about the Anishinaabe perspective. The Anishinaabe people are one of probably 40 or 50 real nations of uh, uh, collectives of those 600 odd um, communities called First Nations across the country. There are 130 of them in Ontario. And uh, but the Anishinaabe are a good a good part of those, and um, uh, we talk about Ontario being Anishinaabe uh, territory largely. And when we, uh, you can see that the teachings show four colors. Uh, that 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 really speaks to the fact that that there are people around the world of different um, colored skin. Uh, we're all in the same circle. We're all related. We should all treat each other like we're related. And um, uh, it also uh, talks about uh, the fact there are four seasons, there are four directions. Um, but when it comes to health, uh, health is more than just physical health. It, 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 it involves um, mental and, or intellectual health. It involves emotional well-being uh, and it involves spiritual uh, well-being as well. So all those four components need to be balanced for a person to be really healthy. Uh, I have a friend who has run, he just celebrated uh, his uh, 3000th consecutive day of jogging. That's good, but, but he also has to make sure that he looks after the other aspects of his health. And um, that's how we get that, that balance. So thank you all for, for coming. Um, uh, this this image also, of course, says that we all of the people in that circle, all of us, uh, we all bring gifts to our society and our knowledge and our ideas and our thoughts are just as valuable as as one another's in that in that circle. So um, so I, I, I the, the the usual um, uh, custom is for me to introduce myself in the language. And um, uh, and then to uh, you know to ask the the creator and, and spirits uh, 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 to show our appreciation for all of those gifts the water that we have the, the, that's our lifeblood the air that we breathe all of the creatures and plants that sustain us uh, human beings um, and and again um, we're very we're very grateful for for all of the all of the gifts that we have to celebrate today. Ani bojo. Benazi Dishnikas was Josh Dorum on a Schnabek, Unquaro Dorum Hodnashoni, Alderville Donjiba, North Bay and Diana, and a Schnabek and Dow. Miguetch Misham Sanonic, Miguetch Nakomas Nonic, Miguetch Takmekwe, Gimijung Shkiki, Gimijung Tikog, Gimijung Siniog, Gimijung Benesio, Gimijung Gagonia, Gimijung Sinin, Gimijung Aki, Gimijung Nodin, Gimijung Skoda, Gimijung Nabi, Gimijung Mijiminwa, Gimijung Mods a win. Sama nagap kidnanan guwednung, wabnung, jaunung, minagabiaunung. Miigwech, 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 miigwech. Thanks, everybody. Miigwech for that opening, Morris. Um, so, Ani Bojo, uh, Dakota Reckley, Indigenous Cause, Mukumkong Donjba. Um, so hi everyone, my name is Dakota Reckley and I reside in the community of Wukwemekong on Manitoulin Island. I am the cultural safety manager at the Indigenous Primary Healthcare Council and I oversee our Indigenous cultural safety program. Um, so moving forward, I'll just give you guys like a quick glance at what today's session will look like. Um, so as you can see, we have some introductions. Um, you will hear some remarks from each of our panelists today, and then we will go into some breakout groups for further Q&A and discussion, and then come back to summarize those discussions. Um, I'll also cover some upcoming um, ICS initiatives that we have. Um, so really quickly, I am going to do a recap from the webinar that we did do back in September, which focused heavily on cultural safety. Um, the things I'm going to go through really quickly um, definitely require a lot more in-depth discussion, but this is just a high-level overview in case some of you may have missed that webinar. Um, we definitely encourage you to go and take a look at it, and I believe um, a link might have been provided to everyone upon registration. Um, so to start, one key component that we emphasize, um, you may have heard the term cultural competency. It's a term that's commonly blended with cultural safety. Um, it's an approach that focuses on acquiring skills, knowledge, and attitudes to work in more effective and respectful ways with Indigenous people and communities. 
However, being knowledgeable about a culture alone does not go far enough to address the underlying health equity issues that permeate the systems we live in. There's a really wide spectrum upon which cultural safety is situated, and it includes, as you can see in this diagram, cultural awareness, sensitivity, competency, and then safety. So cultural safety is an outcome that's based on respectful engagement that recognizes and strives to address power imbalances inherent in the healthcare system. Cultural safety considers how social and historical contexts, as well as structural and interpersonal power imbalances, shape a person's health and healthcare experiences. Healthcare providers and organizations that practice cultural safety are self-reflective and self-aware about their position of power and the impact this role has on Indigenous clients. The most important part about cultural safety is that it is defined by those who receive care, not by those who provide it. A key takeaway in cultural safety is that it's a dynamic and ever-changing process, as can be seen in the cycle in this slide. The cycle combines all the phases that make up cultural safety. It stresses the importance of refreshing our learnings and staying up to date with strategies that boost culturally appropriate and safe care. It is not a linear process and at different stages in our lives, we may be at different parts of the cycle. So we must revisit all aspects of awareness, competency and humility regularly. So why does cultural safety matter and why is there a need for it in healthcare? Indigenous people systematically experience more chronic diseases because of the way intergenerational trauma may shape their past and present lived experiences. We can take steps to reconciliation in healthcare by enabling Indigenous peoples to define their form of cultural safety. This way, we are better positioned to achieve health equity as perceived by Indigenous communities. And so finally, it is crucial to understand and be aware of the history that Indigenous peoples face to better equip yourself to foster culturally safe spaces. Again, this is just a very brief recap on cultural safety. It is not by any means a wholesome picture. And as individuals and providers, in order to take steps in reconciliation, you should seek out trainings and resources that will enhance your knowledge. Um, so I would like to next introduce Dr. Pamela Toulouse. Well, Ani and Bojo this morning, everybody. It's good to see you all here. Oh, I recognize some names in that chat and on the participant list. So in order to begin, my friends, okay, again, because I have like, you know, a little bit of time, not a lot. What I want you to do, my friends, is make this. I swear it's so easy. Make a heart, my friends. Either that or else put the heart in your mind. You can do it. I swear you can. Let us see that heart. Oh, yes. Good luck and hearts all the way around. Bring that heart to the screen so everybody can see it. Oh, my God. Take that heart back. Take that heart back. And I want you to push that heart up to Ishpeming, to the sky. Push it up. Push it up. Oh, yes. Now. Beautiful friends, you're probably wondering, why would, you know, Pam have us do this activity, right? So again, we did this beautiful heart. And the reason why we do that is because it goes back, you know, to a teaching like within my own community. Like, you know, a lot of us here, we're Nishnabek, right? And not only that, my friends, but it's the teaching of damn in, right? So damn in, it's all about our heart. But here's what's interesting about that heart and how it's, again, related to Indigenous cultural safety, okay? Because what we want to do, what we want to do, my beautiful friends, is to ensure, okay, is to ensure that our experiences, that your experience, that my experience, and that patient experiences meet on these levels of kindness and goodness and understanding. That is the teaching of Damon, and Damon comes from something greater than ourselves. So you've got that teaching, my friends. Now, I want you again to go, okay? I want you to go to the wonderful chat, okay? You're gonna see something there. I want you to go and open up that resource, okay? Open up that resource. You'll see it there. You're probably thinking, where is she sending me? How dare she send me away? No, it's okay. Open up the resource because we're going right to my section. Now, 
you're going to see, right? So you take a look at the screen right now, you're gonna see these three wonderful guides, all right? There is a guide on how to, again, how to deliver, again, workshops, whether face-to-face -face or else, again, synchronous like this via a Zoom platform. Okay, but not only that, it's how do I actually, again, not only deliver Indigenous cultural safety workshops, but how do I monitor an online forum? How do I know that there's engagement? You know, but also, you know, also is how is it that we actually monitor and facilitate engagement in, of course, our wonderful discussion forums. Now, beautiful friends, the reason why I put that guide up there, right, is because, you know, you know, ideally, right, ideally, we, we want Indigenous people that have the worldview to deliver, okay, to be delivering these workshops and doing this in a good way. And also, but we also recognize that we have these wonderful allies and accomplices who get it, right, they really get it, and know that Indigenous cultural safety is critical to our lives, right, because it really is, it's about life and death for us, it really is. Now, just going to give you just one thing, very, very quickly, okay? And this is just, you know, a blurb, okay? It's just a blurb that is coming from, okay, that is coming from the actual guide. So this is from the table of contents. Look in the chat, my friends. This is just a little one, all right? So it's like, how do you actually use this guide on how to deliver Indigenous cultural safety workshops in a good way? There's actually really great resources for all of us here. So there's like definitions listen, what is ICS and why is it important? And also the science behind it. So I really about, you know, train the trainer approaches because I am a teacher by nature. Okay. That is my spirit. <laughs> so the important thing is, is that I talk about what train the trainer is and how it works because it is actually what builds capacity, right? It builds capacity. So the guides are set up this way, what to do before the workshop, during the workshop, after the workshop. And then we have these amazing resources, all right, that, you know, take a little bit of the think out. Now you're probably thinking, what do you mean? So I'm gonna put this in the chat again, okay? And you'll see it there. So what I mean is that when you go to the guides, right? It'll have the title, Cultural Safety Resources. And it has a link to an absolute critical document that will support that particular way of, again, teaching, again, and learning about Indigenous cultural safety. So I say, listen, here's what to look for. You know, check out the wise practices, three, four, and five, right? Three, four, and five in this particular resource. And of course, one of the amazing resources, again, comes from, again, collaborators. Collaborators that talk about wise practices for Indigenous specific cultural safety training. So what it does is that it tells you what to look for, gives you the resource, and gives you the wise practices on how to engage. So there's helpful resources for everybody. Now, I'm going to wrap this up because my time is done. So I want you to take those hearts. You show me them. You show, I know you got them there. I know they're behind your screen. Even if you're like, you know, your screen is not on. Let's see those hearts. Let's see those hearts. Put those up, put those up. You got them right here. All right, all right. Bring it back. Oh, damn it. Send that damn it out into the universe. Send out your kindness, your goodness, and your energy, my beautiful friends. And thank you and miigwech for being here, okay? For being here and taking the time. And that's all I would like to say for today. I'll see you in the breakout room. <laughs>
uh, my experience is working with uh, the Indigenous youth population and their mental health. I am very passionate about the youth's authentic voices and bringing um, their voices to the table. I am currently a full-time student at Laurentian studying Indigenous social work. I also work part-time for a high school here in Sudbury, Ontario as an Indigenous support worker for uh, my FNMI students. And this is just what my passion is. I just really enjoy working with youth and uh, bringing their voices to the table. And I have been a part of IPHCC's Knowledge Circle for about a year now. And I am here to talk to everyone in the breakout rooms with Pamela about the importance of youth and their voices and why they are critical in being a part of these conversations when it comes to health and um, all of this with uh, the Ontario teens and everyone. So that's all I have to say for now. Um, oh, yeah, I guess this slide is also me too. <laughs> so yeah, definitely the importance of youth and their voices. Um, I'm also a member on the board of directors for mental health Health Research Canada. I have been doing work with them in providing real research and what that looks like in our youth, doesn't matter if they're Indigenous or not, across Canada. I have been a part of CHIA's Youth Advisory Council and CIHR's Youth Advisory Council um, for a number of years now as well. So um, if you want to talk about credentials and uh, qualifications, I'm the definitely the right person to talk about this uh, particular uh, situation for sure. So miigwech for having me, everyone. And uh, yeah. That's it for me. Thanks, Brett. And next we have Dr. Paula Chitwick. Hello, hello everybody. Thank you for this opportunity to be here today. I'm really, really excited um, about what's about to unfold. Um, and I'd like to share a few thoughts um, uh, that I have on creating safer environments for Indigenous peoples and, and the role of an OHT. I had the privilege of working with the Indigenous Primary Health Care Council on an Indigenous bioethics curriculum. And uh, as an ethicist, uh, this was a unique, standout, seminal experience for me because it was the first time um, I was invited into a space created to build trust and friendship, to share and respect equal and diverse worldviews, and to take the time to deeply appreciate the wisdom of our ancestors and embrace a bold vision for the future. And as this was happening um, in the context in a field of bioethics that I've worked in for more than 25 years. What I thought I knew about the field was broken open and new possibilities were revealed. So one of the gems um, about being part of such a process um, that I'd like to share with you today is that we cannot speak for one another. Everyone must be at the table together. And this is true um, at every level of decision-making about everything in healthcare. So when we ask who is the decision maker and that person is not at the table or who does this primary, this decision primarily affect and they are not at the table, then those decisions are going to be bereft of the wisdom of those who are central to the issue, who may be most harmed, who may be most adversely affected and who may have the greatest needs. So these voices in our work, these voices must be centered. So I believe there's a, an essential role for settlers to share the power we have to make possible what we cannot achieve alone and what we can only achieve together in solving these problems uh, in the healthcare system. So my next slide. So as, as an ethicist uh, working in a huge community hospital in the GTA, uh, I think I can say that we have much to do to support safer environments for Indigenous peoples. Joyce Eshawan died in a Quebec hospital, but she could have been anywhere. 
and had a similar perilous experience. So this picture uh, reminds me of where we need to get to, and I'm sure people have seen it before, but it makes a simple point. Now, our reality is that we know the stories of um, Brian Sinclair and Joyce Eshawan and so many others, and that their treatment in the hospital and the health system was woefully inadequate. We know that we have likely been involved in remedies for these situations, promoting equality. So that's the next box where we give everyone something and hope that it's okay, think it's okay, but this only will work if the needs are the same, but they're often not. So some needs are greater than others, but we often stop there. We did our best. Now, if we go to forward from there to equity, that it gets us closer. And this will work. Um, we will give uh, some, some needs, uh, give more to others and less to others, but this still doesn't get us to true justice and fairness for all, because there's a deeper issue that will undermine our efforts at every, every opportunity and it's the fence. So the invisible structures that exist in our communities that keep us from interrupting this move towards um, justice. So the best scenario and the ethical commitment we need to make is to arrive at justice. And this is a place where there's no fence at all. In other words, there's access to uh, health, it's um, free of all barriers, discrimination and prejudice and racism and so on. So the most important role for a white settler is to figure out how to recognize how we hold up the fence, rebuild the fence, um, protect the fence, and also recognize our role in taking down the fence and keeping it down. So I just wanna say one last thing um, and the next slide. As my colleague Gerwinder Gill has said, we need to move uh, from the golden rule, treat others as we would like to be treated, to the platinum rule, treat others as they would like to be treated. And to do this, we have to know each other. We need to respect each other and understand the value, the values and beliefs of each other. And this kind of knowledge comes through, and I've I've experienced it with the Indigenous Reference Group. It comes through relationships and can lead to possibilities that we have not yet thought of. So I will pause here and hand this over to uh, Stephanie Nixon, a colleague and friend from the, uh, that I had a chance to work with uh, at, the, at the bioethics table. Over to you, Stephanie. Thank you so much, Paula, um, and everyone who came before to help us set up this uh, beautiful gathering today. I'm feeling so lucky to be in this work with you all. I am a white settler for all the other settlers in the audience. I'm with you in this learning journey around cultural safety. What is my work to do? How do I understand myself in it? How am I upholding the fence? I wanna take up uh, Morris's invitation for us to name and look at racism as a prerequisite for doing this work well. We've been, each of us, invited to offer some comments that maybe offer a lesson we've learned in our journeys around cultural safety. And so that's what I want to do today. I want to share a lesson. I want to share a story with you. It's my story. It's a very personal story. Uh, and it is fundamental to how I understand my place in this work. Click. I found out I was white when I was 28 years old. It was in a first year master's class in public health. At that point, I'd been a physiotherapist working clinically for five years with an HIV program. I'd been involved in social justice work for a long, long time. And I was in this class where the prof invited us to reflect on what the social forces were that had shaped our health. And as I listened to my classmates talking about being 
uh, growing up poor or, or being South Asian or being black, it came around to my turn and I was feeling really embarrassed. And here's what I said, like, I said, I'm sorry, I, I don't have anything to offer here. I'm not anything, I'm just normal. But of course I was not just normal, was I, right? I was middle-class, I'm of English and Irish ancestry. I, I was and I am white. And so it, it sort of calls up this question of what assumptions had to be in place for me to see all of that as nothing, as just normal. And especially my whiteness, what? set of assumptions had to be in place for me to see my whiteness as beyond me. Like, and I realized that it required a fundamental misunderstanding of racism, that I had been socialized to understand racism in a particular way that is wrong, that it's only about individuals being mean to each other, it's something bad people do, and that they do intentionally. And that's not it at all. Like, I've now come to understand that what had to be in place for me to understand my whiteness as nothing was a profound position of superiority, such that my whiteness was taken as just the default norm, the single right way to be beyond naming the standard against which everything else was given. Right? And what's that called? And here's Morris uh, warning us early on, like this is really important for us to engage with some of the concepts and terms that, that sometimes make us step back. So let's just go right there. Uh, what is it called when whiteness is taken as the norm, the default standard, just the right way to be? And I'll propose it's called white supremacy, right? And I'm not talking here about white supremacists, individuals intentionally trying to uphold white superiority. I'm talking about like, the political, economic and cultural system that we've all been socialized in that structured our country, right? It, it's on, what's, on which settler colonialism is founded, in which folks who have skin that looks like mine overwhelmingly control power and material resources. Right? We are, it's the, way, the same way that Dakota talked about systematically experiencing like the systematic nature of, of poor health outcomes uh, for indigenous folks. It's the same systematic structures that have created the disproportionate power that's held in the hands of folks with skin that looks like mine. Look, and that also plays out in terms of these conscious and especially unconscious ideas about superiority and entitlement, right? That we are expert, that we are the right ones to be setting the policy or going into that community to help them. Look, and where these relations, this is going back to Paula's comments about the fence, these relations around dominance and subordination, they are reenacted every single day without many of us even knowing that we're doing it. Does that make us innocent? It does not, right? That oblivion needs to be interrupted. So like, this has been what I've come to see as so fundamental to my work in cultural safety is understanding that white supremacy is at the heart of racism. It's at the heart of colonialism, uh, that it's not about me being good or bad, right? I'm not saying that white people are bad. I'm saying whiteness as a superiority structure is bad for all of us, is dangerous. And so whenever I'm having my feelings around guilt and shame as I think about my complicity in this structure and my own concern for my own goodness, that's when I try and do that work of managing my flood of emotions. Whew, and getting back to center and realizing this actually isn't about me or my goodness. I don't need to center my own guilt and shame. I need to pay attention to how I am structured in this history and instead reframe any of those em emotions that are trying to shut down my progress as responsibility for accountable action. So there's that. <laughs> and I, you know, what better opportunity than to be in this work with, with all of you to be saying, Let's look at this stuff, right? Let's uproot it, because this is the way forward. This is what is so special about cultural safety. This is what makes it so different than just looking outwardly at change. It's doing this work and seeing how we are all in it together. How can we all get it? And with that, with much gratitude, I turn it back to Morris. 
miigwech, Stephanie, and and thank you and Paula, you know, and and um, and Pamela for you know for um, speaking from your hearts. Remember when I showed that medicine wheel? Um, you know, it, um, uh, it it talks about the importance of not just um, um, you know intelligence from our heads it's now there's a, a, a great body of thought thinks we need more in our world of emotional intelligence that's that's using our heart and that word that that pam says that word uh, um uh, day that sound day means the heart and uh um the word strawberry is odemen a, a berry that's that's shaped like our hearts and the anishinaabe one word for truth is dibwewin which means uh, speaking from your heart um, and, and that's how people in healthcare in particular have to, have to approach their work is, is it, it, they have a lot of technical skills, obviously, but they, they, they need to have heart skills because they're caring for people who are very vulnerable um, and, and who come from a very broad range of, of backgrounds. And, and it's very frightening to be in, in many healthcare situations, uh, particularly if you you feel that that uh, you're surrounded by strangers. So, so I, I want to thank the people who are talking from their hearts. Um, I, I a couple of weeks ago, the Nobel Prize for Medicine was announced, and it went to a, a researcher, I think from the United States, who who was given credit for um, the discovery, uh, sort of like Columbus was given credit for discovering in North America. Uh, he was given credit for the discovery of the use of common peppers in uh, in affecting pain receptors in human beings. Well, that was nice uh, that he got that recognition. The fact is that indigenous people have been using capsaicin um, for pain treatment for thousands of years. Um, uh, we we uh, had to have a lot of knowledge to survive as the first peoples. And um, uh, the fact that we didn't, that we shared all of our knowledge, particularly with newcomers who came to our shores, whether it was about uh, how to build shelters, where to find food, how to hunt, how to fish. Um, the fact that we shared those things and didn't put patents on them uh, doesn't mean that we, we didn't have the, uh, you know, the wisdom and the creativity to, to um, invent or create uh, these things, uh, it, it meant that we shared things. And there are something like 500 medicines in modern pharmacopoeia that were first used by indigenous peoples of the Americas. Um, so, uh, and I've decided that I want to share a personal story with you that, that I think reflects the importance of that, that knowledge, that, uh, uh, that knowledge. I don't often share personal things, but I think uh, I've thought that um, that I would today, and it deals with the experience that myself and my late wife Mary, uh, who was the most gentle, kind person I've ever met in my life. Um, uh, she's no longer with us, but but uh, we had more time uh, than than many people get. We were together for over thirty five years, and in two thousand and four, my wife Mary, who was not indigenous. Uh, came from European background, but who respected all cultures uh, innately. She had a respect for people of all different backgrounds. Um, and she was diagnosed with, uh, I believe it was called small cell carcinoma, which uh, it was described to me as little dots on her chest wall. She never smoked, although she, in, in some of her jobs, she was in offices where a lot of other people did smoke cigarettes. Um, and uh, it was inoperable uh, because you can't, our, our, with all of our ingenuity, um, uh, modern medical science uh, cannot remove somebody's chest wall. So um, I was given the news kind of abruptly by one of the, a young man who is regarded as one of the most outstanding thoracic surgeons in certainly in Northern Ontario, maybe the province. And he basically told me that my wife had three to six months to live. Uh, you can imagine 
some of you have had that experience, what it was like when you're with someone for 35 years and you hear that, and uh, there was no great outward sign of, of, of frailty or, or immobility or suffering or pain. Um, so we started on a journey and um, uh, we went through the, uh, the, the uh, Western channels of medicine, what, what people of European background would call traditional. Uh, my, we were blessed by having a family doctor here in North Bay, whose name is Dr. Wendy Graham. She's still practicing. Many people have re retired. She's, uh, um, and Wendy has always meant a lot to me as a caregiver because um, she has an innate respect for uh, other people of other backgrounds. And she, without any hint, she said to, to me, if you want to pursue any indigenous healing methods, you go ahead. And I asked, of course, Mary, and she was receptive to that. She wanted to live. She, was, she had grandchildren. She loved life. And, um, and she still pursued the advice of the, you know, of the Western medicine caregivers. Uh, one of whom was a man, I think he's retired now, named Dr. Lopez at uh, Sud uh, Sudbury, about an hour and a half from North Bay. And they have a wonderful cancer treatment center there. And um, Dr. Lopez was, was one of the most uh, kind uh, medical practitioners I've ever met. And uh, he had lots of time for, for Mary to listen to her, to talk to her. He understood the importance of uh, of emotional, um, spiritual, uh, intellectual, and, and physical health. He understood that innately. Uh, actually, her first um, specialist was a, a woman who uh, was a, apparently a brilliant technical medical professional, but who had this very disturbing habit of when she was talking with, with Mary, looking at her watch um, as if... Um, uh, she had some other uh, a place to be. And, and my wife, who was so kind, never criticized people. She, it bothered her so much. And, and she asked if she could uh, see another specialist. And that was Dr. Lopez. Um, with Mary's approval, I had uh, heard of a, of a medicine man, as the saying goes, in, um, in Eastern Canada, his name was David Geo. He was a big man, a rough man, but so kind and gentle when it came to dealing with people like, like Mary. And uh, he was gifted with certain um, abilities. Um, people who call themselves healers, they, in my experience, they don't believe they have the power to heal anybody. They believe that they can work with, um, with people who have open minds uh, to help them heal themselves. And um, working with David by phone and in person, we had him in our home. He was from a place called Indian Brook, Nova Scotia. Um, and uh, working with him, um, uh, those three to six months became five years, a gift uh, that meant so much to us. Uh, five more years um, of life together. And uh, Mary and I went back to, and, and when her, her, um, her symptoms were showing signs of remission, uh, Dr. Lopez and Sudbury said, whatever you're doing, keep doing it. That's what we needed to hear. Not doctors who I've heard tell patients, if you get advice or do treatments with anybody but me, I won't see you anymore. I've heard that so many times. Um, so that gift of five years was, was, um, that was a gift, not just from David Geo, our indigenous, um, uh, medicine, uh, man, but from the open-mindedness of Dr. Wendy Graham and Dr. Lopez, who, who understood more about how important it is, you know, to have a balance in healing and to listen to your patients. Um, as well as to other people's advice, uh, that was a credit to all of them. And it's a gift that I will always, uh, always treasure. 
So I tell you that story. I, I'm embarrassed to talk about personal things, but I think for this audience, I think I needed to tell that story. And I hope it has some meaning for you in how you do your jobs, um, which are so important in our society. And, um, and thank you again for your time, for, for listening to us and for being here. And, and, and thank you for the challenging work that you, you do. Miigwech, thanks. Miigwech, Morris. Um, so next we actually will be going into our breakout sessions. Um, we have two groups. Um, so the first group will be um, myself, Morris, um, Stephanie, and then we have Saudia supporting us with facilitation. And in our second group, we have, um, actually, sorry, I think it's Roma in my group. <laughs> we have Brett, Paula, and uh, Pamela. I may have mixed the names up a little bit. My apologies for that. Um, and I'm not sure that the breakout sessions, maybe um, our folks at RISE can help with that. Um, I'm not, that's not my area of expertise. <laughs> Thanks, Dakota. Yeah, so I think um, Steve has organized the breakout groups. So you should start to see um, you an invite to go into one and you just hit join and it should take you in at any time. If you need to come back to the main room, you can do that. And Steve will be here to help you with any technical issues. All right. Thanks, everyone. All right. I'll pass it back over to uh, Dakota and Roma. Uh, thanks, Leslie. Um, and thank you, everyone. I hope that you had some really good um, discussions. Um, I can say um, for those that were not in our breakout room one, um, I'm not sure what it was like for your group, Roma, but lots of questions around, um, you know, relationship building um, and how to proceed with that engagement and how to build trust. Um, and unfortunately, in the small period of time we have is definitely not enough to really, um, you know, capture that um, and next steps. But, um, you know, hopefully you were able to take something away. Um, I'm not sure if everyone can see, but I did put a couple like um, messages in the chat. Um, is everyone able to see that or only those that were in our room? Okay, so I can like copy and paste again to the main chat because they're just some um, just some key messages that you could probably take away from this session. And I'll pass it over to you, Roma, if there's anything you wanted to highlight that was kind of talked about in yours. Thanks, Dakota. Yeah, we had some good questions and really, you know, people just really want to, um, you know, learn more about um, how to build relationships and the responses were very open and letting people know that it's, it really is about learning and asking questions and um, people are also interested in, in understanding um, the structures of uh, of how um, indigenous um, communities are in urban First Nations in different air sectors such as education, justice, etc., and and you know how um, to to reach out and and. In, include as, as many organizations as possible um, and how challenging that can be. Um, the one, uh, we did have our, our last question at the end about a word that describes a feeling or thought. And I'm pleased to say that the biggest word in the center of that word cloud was hopeful. So um, I think that's a good message that um, people um, got some really good information today and feel good about their journey forward. Thanks, Roma. Um, so I just want to really quickly, because I think that a lot of these um, guides that we currently have available at IPHCC, as well as some upcoming initiatives, um, would really benefit everyone in this group um, and, you know, further kind of answer some of those questions that everyone had, um, you know, with engagement being the key thing and really the next steps in that engagement, um, as I mentioned, is understanding the history and the contemporary, um, you know, issues that Indigenous communities are facing. Um, so some of these guides are already available and I noticed Pam was putting into the chat um, some information on her wise practices guideline that um, she has been working on very um, diligently for us here um, with the support of our knowledge keepers as well. 
Um, and then we have, you know, some guides on creating safer spaces. Some of these stuff, as I mentioned, was created specifically for COVID, but there are some really great key takeaways in these guidelines and resources. Um, and you can access all of these um, through our IPHCC.ca website. Um, but one thing that I really do want to highlight like further to the kind of toolkits and guidelines that we already currently have available um, is the launch of our Indigenous cultural safety training, um, which is actually launching on October 27th. Um, so we are very proud here at IPHCC. Um, a lot of hard work has gone into this um, with uh, content experts from Ontario, our knowledge keepers, our elders, um, and by no means was this developed just solely on our end. Um, we had a lot of support um, to feed into the content of this course. So it will be available October 27th for registration. And uh, you can email either ics at iphcc.ca or you can go right to our website um, and see the Indigenous Cultural Safety Training um, if you want any more additional information on that. We are very excited about it and it will kind of dive into, um, you know, the history. Um, it's a very interactive um, course, so it, it allows you to take some time for self-reflection. Um, and just to highlight that some of the experiences that are within this course, it's a scenario based module, um, and these were adapted from real life um, experiences of Indigenous people um, when accessing healthcare. So some of the um, content might be difficult, um, but it, it is, it, as I mentioned, adapted from real life situations. So um, I definitely encourage everyone here to take a look if possible. Um, and I noticed there, there was a hand up. Yeah, Arun, you've yeah. got your hand up. All right, my question is, we have been hearing the word, how can we enhance relationship? How can we do? But I'm looking for the suggestions or the way, how can we do those things? Okay, because we have a, a, a huge forum here with fantastic ideas, with open mind, and that are the type of suggestions I'm looking for here so that we can all uh, work on those uh, recommendations, how can we make them uh, the indigenous and our own people part of our process? How can we make sure that what they have is value added? How can we make sure that what we have and if they have has synergies in it? So I'm looking at the those type of things, recommendations, suggestions, the opportunities for improvement, those type of things. Um, it's, um, if you don't mind, uh, one of the um, one of the things that came up in something that people wanted to learn about was how to include um, indigenous voices in decision making, and I think that that is one way in which you can help to make that happen. Is look at um, where decisions are being made at your various tables. And when you are uh, bringing together new ideas and making decisions about how you're gonna move forward, but actually including them at that level um, is one way to actually make that happen. I don't, I don't know if anyone else wants to add to that. We have two minutes. Yeah. Yeah, just to elaborate, like, you know, we we as a group here, we definitely don't have all the answers. Um, and this is what we strive for at IPHCC is building those tools and resources. Um, because one expectation is that you, you can't put the expectation on Indigenous communities to give you that how to. Um, so as organizations and individuals, you have to build that capacity to understand how to make that engagement. And then as Roma said, including them in the decision making. So not approaching, you know, communities afterwards, um, bringing them in at the onset and making sure they are inclusive in, in those decision making tables. Um, and one thing that, you know, we're proud of here too with our training is we took a co-design approach to this training um, and, you know, the model of two-eyed seeing. So I, I'm super grateful that we had Stephanie and Paula on this webinar as well, because, um, you know, we very much value, you know, their opinions as well. Um, and the, the model of two-eyed seeing um, is using, you know, the Western way of knowing and the Indigenous way of knowing and bringing those together um, for the benefit of everyone. 
Um, but that means like at the onset of this, right? So that that can be the only really thing I can say for the how is like they need to be there present from the beginning, not just kind of a thought that like, let's bring them in, you know, in bits and pieces along the way. Um, you know, whether that be like policy making, decision making, different, you know, um, advisory tables, they, they need to have those voices there. Thank you very much. So, uh, Rob Reed again, I just wanted to so much thank uh, thank our panelists today, uh, Roma, uh, Dakota, Dr. Pam, Brett, Stephanie, Paula, and particularly uh, Maurice for sharing their wisdom with us today. Uh, I learned a lot. I know many of the other uh, uh, participants here learned a lot on our journey together. Uh, to improve healthcare um, for everybody, including Indigenous people in Ontario, and that's that's what our job is. So, uh, thank you so much for participating, um, and I very much encourage everybody here to spread the word of the resources Dakota mentioned. Uh, sign up for the workshops. Um, I think that is a, a terrific way for us to continue our learning journey together. Um, Meet which from from rise and we will see you at the next rise event in in november